I'm Taylor Perry and this is Hey Westport. Despite its picturesque streets and closely connected community, Westport is quietly grappling with an issue that many residents prefer not to acknowledge. I think that Westport likes to pretend that the problem isn't here, but it is. Um, Bristol County is fifth in the state for overdose deaths, and Westport has had 43 deaths from opioid overdose since 2016. So 43 might not sound like a lot of people, but that's 43 families that have lost a loved one and any loss to overdose is too many. So I would say the problem is very much here. Once an issue thought to only affect larger cities, opioid addiction has quietly seeped into the fabric of this close-knit town. Olive Wachersky tells us that fentanyl is the leading cause of overdose. Fentanyl is generally the cause of death for overdose deaths. Um, and that can be present in almost any substance. So people find it in stimulants, so like cocaine, methamphetamine. They also find people trying to buy pills off of the street. So pills that maybe they're being told are Adderall, maybe they're being told are other pain medications, and they contain fentanyl, and that's generally how people pass away. Um, xylazine is also present in a lot of drugs nowadays that are purchased off the street and that's an animal tranquilizer. It's not meant for human use. So unfortunately that can cause really serious wounds if they don't pass away um, that require long-term care. And I would say that most folks are getting them not through prescribers, they're getting them through um, like, you know, people on the street. With a lack of services in Westport, many locals travel to neighboring cities for the help they require. Unfortunately, Westport has a long way to go in terms of resources for folks who have a substance use disorder. Um, most of the resources, I would say, are in the bigger towns nearby, so Fall River, New Bedford, and Dartmouth. Um, here in Westport, we have a couple small things, like the Board of Health has free Narcan for anyone who wants to pick it up. Um, they also have a place where you can drop off used sharps, um, and then the Fire department also has free Narcan that anyone can come and grab. Other than that, there's not much going on here in Westport to help folks. Um, so I would say that's one of our big goals for this year and the upcoming years is to try to get some resources in town because that would also reduce stigma as well. Seeing resources in your town helps you realize that there are folks around who are struggling and hey, maybe it's not like, maybe I'm not alone or maybe my family member's not alone in this. There's a variety of action being taken nationwide to assist the opioids crisis, such as legal response against Big Pharma and also pushing back against the stigma of addiction. Prescribing of opioids has actually decreased a lot in the past few years. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the lawsuits that have come up, but um, states have sued these companies that have created these drugs and sold the drugs to like doctor's offices and asked them to prescribe them. And so now people are much more careful about prescribing opiates to people. And also we have that tracking system in place. But um, there are opioid settlement funds now that we've gotten as a result. So each town has a certain amount of money that they're getting from these companies as a settlement. And all of that money can be used for mitigating overdose deaths and other issues that come up with substance use in their towns. Um, but I would say the main thing that would help is reducing stigma. Here in Westport, I think since it's a small town, it feels like everybody knows your business. And so nobody wants to talk about if they have a substance use disorder or if someone in their family has overdosed. And that just leads to more secrecy and unfortunately more deaths. So to me, I think the biggest thing that we can do is keep talking about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. If you have a substance use disorder or if a loved one does, because that could potentially save their life or someone else's life. Um, harm reduction methods are also really important, which include Narcan or a safe needle exchange program. Um, there are a lot of different harm reduction methods that I think we could adopt here, but I would say keeping Narcan on your person at all times is a really effective one, just in case you come across somebody who's overdosing. If you have a family member or friend struggling with addiction, the best thing you can do for them is provide support. 
The most important thing that you can do is obviously talk to them about it. People think that the opposite of sobriety is addiction or, you know, the opposite of addiction is sobriety and actually the opposite of addiction is community. So a lot of folks use alone, they feel alone, they start to be a recluse, they hide away. And if you can try to keep them in community in any way possible, that can really save their life. And then again, the harm reduction methods. Some people think that, you know, using Narcan to save somebody who's overdosing is giving them another chance to use drugs or giving them another chance to overdose and what's the point? But a person who's dead can't go to rehab. A person who's dead can't eventually become sober. So you have to save their life in order for any positive change to happen. Let's get to know a local family who is providing the town with a taste of tradition and exceptional wines that bring the community together with every bottle they produce. The Westport Rivers Winery is a popular family-owned business in town. With stunning views over 80 acres of working farmland, the Russell family has turned the property into a plethora of businesses with a deep regard for local agriculture and education. Owner Rob Russell is passionate on his family's dedication to the land. I started working here in 1985 uh, after working a year on Long Island in a vineyard down there. This all started with my great-grandfather in Hammondsport, New York. He had a winery there and uh, that winery uh, was sold during Prohibition, but my, this is my great-grandfather on my mom's side, and my parents had always heard about these uh, stories about that and kind of had a romantic kind of idea uh, about this industry and kind of started, then went to a home winemaking kit bought in 1970. My mom had bought my, my dad this, and it became a hobby of his through the 70s. And he started uh, planting grapes and making wine. My folks chose Westport was because it was a farming community, um, and just felt that there would be a lot of support here um, in, in doing this. And that was in 1982, and we bought this farm from uh, Bill, David, and Bob Smith, the Smith family. They had owned it for about 100 years before we bought it. So what exists today is uh, really, uh, we call it Russell Family Farms. It's a trust, and the, the farm is 430 acres. Uh, we run uh, several different businesses on it uh, besides the winery. We also run Buzz's Bay Brewing, which my brother Bill manages, and uh, my daughter started a, a flower farm. It's called Wild Bean uh, Flower Farm, and uh, so she runs that. Uh, believe it or not, we also uh, we have uh, part of the farm is up the street, and it's uh, zoned commercial. We uh, another son, uh, Austin, he runs an auto dealership there. Um, so we've got a multi whole multitude of different businesses that we run on our farm. The vineyard has an array of unique possibilities on its ground that are available to customers. People come down here to visit us uh, not only because, as you can see, it's a beautiful site, uh, especially this time of year. Uh, but uh, people can do wine tastings here. Uh, they can uh, also purchase a flight, which is like their choice of up to f of five wines. Uh, we uh, operate a food truck seasonally uh, that stays here on site. It's called the Farmer's Feast, and uh, that offers a bunch of different foods, and that's open daily uh, from 11 to 6 or 5 when we close. Um, people also can uh, walk around on the grounds freely. The winery also offers in-house events open to their customers. These events have grown in popularity, providing tradition for locals and newcomers and those looking for a beautiful service on the grounds. Specifically, some of the events that we do, are, the biggest event we do would be like our Sunset Music Series, uh, where uh, about 15, 16 times a year throughout the summer on Friday nights, mostly Friday nights, we'll do some Saturdays. Uh, we have um, people, host people on the lawn here, We'll have one or two uh, musicians uh, playing acoustic, acoustic guitar down on the little stage down there. And uh, we'll have up to five food trucks here. It's really not a concert, it's kind of more of an event. It's not something anybody would ever shush you at for talking. Um, so it's a lot of fun. We put, you know, hundreds of people on the lawn uh, for it's a two to three hour event. Outside, we do a lot of fundraisers uh, for different organizations. Um, we have a uh, 
like a wine loft upstairs in our company store where, which people can rent out. Uh, I think the seating is up for up to 35 people up there. So it's, that tends to be for smaller groups. While there are many exciting and interesting things on its surface, diving deep into the production aspect to this vineyard is fascinating and impressive. Production uh, on, on our farm, uh, we're focusing mostly on grapevines. Like I said earlier, we've got about 80 acres. Uh, the main varieties we grow are Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Noir, but there's about uh, six or seven other varieties that we grow on a smaller scale. We start by doing a dormant pruning on the vines. Uh, we then tie them down. We move our catch wires down. Um, during the season when they start to grow, there's a lot of uh, shoot positioning and training. Well, uh, fruit remove, not fruit, well, we do some fruit removal, but also leaf removal and hedging of the vines. That's why if you drive by, they look like hedgerows. So we tend to focus on making white wines and sparkling wines like champagne. Uh, we do grow some reds, but uh, it's much easier. The thing that we do the, the best is sparkling wines. The Russell family has taken measures to ensure that this land will always have a presence in Westport. On the farming end of things, uh, we as a family decided to permanently preserve the entire farm here. Uh, it's all uh, been entered into the Massachusetts API program. API stands for Agricultural Preservation Restriction, which means uh, we can't develop it for housing um, or anything else, and it's supposed to remain in agriculture. So that just helps to preserve open space in Westport. The Westport Art Group is a thriving community of creatives dedicated to celebrating and nurturing the arts in town. To promote interest and activity in the arts and crafts is the statement purpose of the Westport Art Group. Started in 1955, this group of local and out-of-town artists has continued to flourish over the years. Secretary Susan Montgomery holds one of the many prominent roles in the group. The Westport Art Group has been um, in this area for over 50 years. It was started by five women who got together and started to paint and decided to have an organization and they called it the Westport Art Group. And they incorporated a few years later. And from the very, very first show more than 50 years ago, one of the main events was an annual community show. And that's in the summer, we just finished it. And the community show is open to painters, photographers, ceramists, sculptor artists of any type, whether they're members or not. Um, so it really is a community show. And we have a lot of other shows. Some shows show only our members, and some shows are open to people who are not members to participate. The art group has an array of promoted activities that get artists out into the local environment for inspiration and group bonding. And so some of the other activities that we have, we have a, another long, long standing activity. The group has been a group of painters who get together on Thursdays and they usually paint outside, so they're called plein air painters. And the plein air painting group has been around for decades. Not always the same people, of course. And so they'll pick different areas and go outside. You saw them this morning. They were painting down near the docks on Westport Point. And um, now they're getting together and they'll all talk about their paintings that they did. Some of them are sketching. Sometimes somebody will be taking photographs and they'll talk about their work with each other. That's called a crit. It's kind of a, a, an activity within the group without a particular teacher leading it. The Thursday painters are painting from Westport Art Group and we paint on location every week, different locations. It's a wonderful place to paint. We have a choice of boats and old houses and beautiful scenery right here in Westport. With its many offerings, getting involved in the group is a great way to be a part of the community. We would love to have more members. We're always happy to have people join and I want to emphasize you don't have to be an artist to be a member. I mean, it's a volunteer organization. If you want to be part of the activities, helping to organize shows, coming to speaker series that we have, then we're glad to have you be a member. By joining the Westport Art Group, members have the special opportunity to sell their smaller and unique pieces in the group's own gift shop. In the hallway now of this building, we have something called the Periwinkle Shop. And that name goes back 
I keep saying almost 50 years, but it's true. A lot of the things we do, we've done a long time. And the Periwinkle Shop is an opportunity for members of the organization to sell things that are more gift type items. So um, uh, note cards, uh, very smaller size paintings, sometimes jewelry, sometimes small ceramics. If they have written a book, the book might be there. Um, and that whenever the building's open, anybody in the building can buy from the shop. And those are all members' works. Member and non-members are also given the chance to network and sell their pieces through the art group's many shows they hold. But many of our members use um, this as an opportunity not just to share their work with the public, but also to sell their work. So, for example, right now um, we're standing in one of the two galleries um, and we have a, an invitational photography show going on. There's 25 different photographers who were invited and their work was selected. They each have two or three photographs in the show. Um, I would say of the 70-something photographs that are here, they're all but, say, three or four are for sale. Connecting on numerous levels with different artists is just one of the many beneficiary parts of the Westport Art Group. Artists stay in the local setting for years because of the creative relationships made in this special place. To be a member of a group means you're part of a group of people who are interested in something similar. So you could say, well, it's like joining a club, right? You know, or people who play chess or people who, these are people who make art. And that would definitely be true. But I am in the process of um, pulling together historic material about the art group for the Westport Historic Society. And I've gone and spoken to some of the older members who have been members for you know, 30, 40 years. And one of my questions that I asked them was, so what do you think is an important thing about being in the art group? Or what, what do you value most? Why? And it was very interesting to me because many, many of them said it was being part of a community where people are making things. And it wasn't like, I'm a painter, I want to be part of a community of painters. It was that the people in, the, in this group are all making something. They're creating something and they want to talk about it. And it's a positive thing to be doing in this world. And it's a community, it's a very welcoming community, like the painters you saw painting down on the docks. They get together and they like to paint outside, they could do that alone, but doing it together is different. You, you um, interact with other people, you see what they're doing, you talk about each other's work. And so, I, you know, the members who've been members for 40 years or so, that's, that's what they would really, if they were answering your question, I know that's what they would emphasize.